In this part of the Nine Secrets video series, we dive into the text, color, and structural guidelines to use in Figma when creating your landing page designs. As always, let's jump straight in. Okay, so before we actually start designing our landing pages, I want to talk about some key principles that are super good to have with us when we're designing the landing page. Here we have text principles, we have color principles, and we have structural principles. All of these will make up our base. So let's go to text principles. And this one is pretty simple, but I think this is something that not a lot of people appreciate enough. And that is one font is enough. Maybe you see these award-winning websites using all kinds of different typography. It looks beautiful when you're able to master that. But as a beginner designer and even as a seasoned designer myself, using one font is very helpful when it comes to just creating beautiful things. It makes it a lot easier because you don't have to worry about fonts actually matching each other and making everything go together in a nice way. You can just focus on nailing down that one font that you're using. Next up is you should probably establish a text hierarchy before you start designing. And this either you do it as you're designing or you do it as a start. I think it's probably a good idea to do it in the start because then you have a good idea of what you'll be working with in terms of text sizes. You could do this manually, so you could create your headings just by hitting the T and then do heading one and then you maybe duplicate it and you hit K, you minimize it a bit and then you could go into each and every one of these and tweak the details or you could use a plugin and I have talked about this plugin before called type scales. You can find that in my video about the most underrated plugins in 2022. And in this plugin, we can set our base size. So what is gonna be like our main kind of body text size. Maybe we want it to be 18 and we can set how much everything is gonna scale each step. This is 125, you can say 1.3 maybe. And then we can set our align height and how many scales up from the base size and how many scales down from the base size. And then we can choose to round the values so that we get these neat numbers or we could choose not to do it and we get these non-rounded numbers. When that's done, we can click generate. We have ourselves a frame that includes our font or text hierarchy. So that's the second thing, establish a text hierarchy. Next one is line height, font weight, and letter spacing. This one is so important because you could choose the most beautiful font, but if you don't know how to handle the line heights, the font weights, and the letter spacing, it's not for certain that it's gonna look good in the end. So take a look at this left one. Can you see how this is very balanced? The letters have a nice distance between each other. The line height is very well balanced. This looks like something that could come from Apple, for example, a very nice looking text. And we have this one, which is the exact same font. This is inter and this is inter, but this one doesn't look nearly as balanced, as nice as the previous one, because you have these big gaps between the letters. You have a gap between the rows. It just doesn't look balanced. This really, emphasizes or points out the importance of using line height, font width, and letter spacing as a tool to make your fonts look good. So what you could do is you have your reference designs from the Frankenstein wireframes, right? So find a similar font and then try to mimic these settings that they have. So for line height, font weight, and letter spacing. Then we jump to legibility and oftentimes this is neglected. You're gonna see amazing looking websites, maybe even websites that wins awards and that are super hyped will use text that is barely legible in cases where it needs to be legible. Because in the end, we're designing for humans here. We're designing for people who are gonna read your stuff, right? And this is extra important if you're creating a website where you have content, a lot of content, like paragraphs of text, 
that people are going to read. A blog, for example, so if we look at Medium, they're using 20 pixels as their base size for the main content on their website. And you can see the difference here between using 20 pixels and 12 pixels. It's a huge difference. And this is not legible and not suited for these long kinds of paragraphs. Meanwhile, 20 pixels is very suited for that. So keep in mind legibility. Then we have some color principles. Try to save strong colors for important things. And this includes your primary and secondary colors. So for example, look at this page here. We have a very clear call to action on this page. We want people to join the waiting list. And we want that join the waiting list call to action to be the most important thing on the website. We want people to look at that. So we use our primary color to incentivize people, to get them to click on this, to draw their attention to this. Then we have the same thing happening here. We have a feature for this app. We have this call to action button that uses the clearest, most strong color on the whole entire section, which draws our attention to this button. Same thing happening here for this text. We pick the networks we support, and then we emphasize support with a color because that's maybe in this case, what we want the user to think about support. Same thing with Google here. Very clean site, everything's white and gray and subtle colors. And then we have the call to action, which is this clear blue Google color. So use your strong colors for important things. Then also try to use subtle shapes and tints. So let's take this section, for example. This is kind of the footer section. You can see here on Copy AI, they have this color as their primary color. Now look at this footer section here. What that is, it is just the same color that they've basically just reduced the opacity to create this very nice looking tint. And it creates this nice dynamic on the website or in this section in particular. You can see that they use it for this checkbox as well. So that's one example of doing it. Here's another example where we use a gray for this card design and using a gray like this or this previous tint on top of white looks really, really good. And you can do it in dark mode as well. It's just a shade instead, or it could be a tint, but you have to play with the colors a bit differently. So here you can see they use the gray for the card. Here we also have a gray for the card and we have the text here where they use gray for some parts of the text because maybe this is what we want to draw attention to. Once again, use the stronger colors for things that are more important. And here we have an example from Google again. They have these active indicators. You can see how they use the gray when they're not active. The same for this mock-up. See this subtle gray. This makes us focus on the call to action here the only place in the design that has blue. And it calls out this detail for us. And then the last thing for colors is to always contrast check your text against your colors. You want to make sure that your text passes the AA plus test. And what that means, I'm gonna show you. And for this, I'm using a plugin. The plugin is called Contrast, and that is a way for you to check your text contrast against backgrounds. So here you can see that just by targeting the text, we get this little panel here in the plugin that shows us what it looks like, but also what we're failing or what we're passing. So for large text, we can see that we pass the AA test, but we fail the triple A test. For normal text, which would be body text, we don't even pass the AA test. So that's for the dark text on the background. We take the light text, then we pass the double A for normal text. We pass double A and triple A for large text and double A for graphics. But the further down we go, the more we're gonna fail here. So once again, check your colors, check your text colors against your backgrounds to make sure that they're passing the double A standard. Last, but not least in the least bit is structural principles. And the first thing I want to talk about here, and this is a personal favorite, the eight point grid system. Ooh, sounds scary, but it's very simple, to be honest. 
This is simply you choosing heights and widths and sizes with the number eight in mind. So if we take this box here, with this text, it says padding 56. And that just means that we have 56 pixels in padding in all directions for this button or whatever it is. And why 56? Well, because 56 is divisible by eight. Here we have 40. Why 40? Because it's divisible by eight. 24. You guessed it, divisible by eight. Same with the distances, 56, 56, between those, divisible by eight. Then we have sizes for icons. Here we have 96, divisible by eight. 64, divisible by eight. 24, you get it. We even use it for buttons. So here's a button large that is 64 pixels in height, 32 pixels in horizontal padding, a button medium, 48 pixels in height, and 24 pixels in horizontal padding. Button small, 40 pixels high, 16 pixels in horizontal padding. So this is a great way, a really, really great way for you to stay consistent with your designs and make sure that everything has this pattern that you can follow and developers, when you hand over the design, they know that everything should be divisible by eight. If you start implementing this, you will start seeing much more consistency across all of your designs. To help this, or to help you with achieving this, you could create what's called a baseline grid. I've taken a frame, I've added a layout grid by hitting the plus here. Once I hit the plus, I choose rows. Then I just took an arbitrary count here. I took a thousand because we wanted to cover the full height of the frame. I choose type to be top. So the rows are gonna start in the top. I choose the height to be eight pixels and the gutter to be eight pixels. So it stays aligned to this eight point grid. So now if I start resizing things, it's gonna snap to eight pixels. And if I don't want to see these red lines, I could just go in here, remove the height, and we're still, sorry, we're still gonna be able to have this snapping effect, but we won't have to see those red lines that might be in the way of our beautiful designs. And then we have 12 column layouts, and this will make everybody happy, including yourself, because if you use this, you will see how your designs become even more consistent. And your developers will thank you because this is the way they're implementing designs onto the web and making actual websites. So what is 12 column layouts? Well, it's very similar to the baseline grid. If we click the frame here, we go to the layout grid panel here, we click it, you can see that it says columns instead of rows. And here we have a count of 12. Then we have type stretch and we have a margin. This margin you can set to whatever you want, really. This is up to your personal preferences. What do you want your design to look like? I've set it to 156 and I've set the gutter here to 20 pixels. And the gutter is just the distance, once again, between these columns. Now, what's pretty amazing with this is that, first of all, I don't know if you noticed, but this is the Frankenstein wireframes. And remember, these wireframes, or these sections here, are all taken from different websites. But if you look here, you can see that I made them all match the 12 column grid, or the 12 column layout that we've set up here. And that's because this is the standard of creating designs. So all of these things will help us create the base. And this is all we need to get started. Because now we have our palette, we have our text hierarchy, we have our structure, we have the Frankenstein wireframe, and we have our stylistic inspo. Keep in mind that all of this is fluid. You don't have to stick to this exact text hierarchy if you don't want to. If you feel that it doesn't really work, then you can change it as you go. The same with the color palette. Everything is easy to change, but at least you have this base, which is awesome because now you can get started and just yeah, start designing. In the next video, we will design the full landing page and I will show you my workflow when it comes to creating landing page designs in Figma. If you wanna support liking, subscribing, commenting, all of these things help guys. Now, until the next one, have a great life and we'll talk soon. Ciao.